Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Heather and I'm on the marketing team at Eagle Eye Networks. Today's webinar topic is how to leverage thermal cameras for your business and this is the Eagle Eye Thermal Camera Overview. Before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the Zoom Q&A box at any time and we'll address them at the end of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email with the full recording along with further information after the webinar. Now I will go ahead and introduce your speaker for today. Hans Kaler is Vice President of Operations and Business Development at Eli Networks. In his role, he's responsible for product management, strategic accounts, technology partnerships, and business development. He's here with He's been with Eagle Eye Networks for over six years, and he's here today to go more in depth on the topic. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Hans. All right, thanks, Heather, appreciate that. Sorry, I had a little trouble with the mute button there. Uh, so thanks everybody for joining. We're gonna go through uh, thermal cameras uh, and talk a little bit about what we know and uh, how they can be used uh, for you guys. So, uh, but however, at first, we got a little bit of a disclaimer here, and generally I click right through these kinds of things, but I think this is really important to talk about because this is such a sensitive topic, and I'm not gonna read this word for word for you guys, but there are a lot of different scenarios where you really need to think about, is a thermal camera the right application for temperature screening? And that's some of what we're gonna talk about here, but uh, at any rate, just keep in mind that these are different and we're gonna go through a lot of what those differences are uh, throughout this presentation. So as we're going through this, uh, there's a couple of quick notes that I wanna cover before we get started. So we're using Fahrenheit throughout this presentation. Uh, that I, These products do work in Celsius also, but since this is primarily a US audience, I do realize there are a few people from outside the US, so apologize for the all Fahrenheit usage, but. You know, there, there's actually a couple of screenshots of Celsius used throughout here, but generally speaking, the products work in Fahrenheit and Celsius. Also, when I'm talking, I'm using the term organizations, and that could really be, you know, a business or anything else. Could be a government agency, could be a church, could be a school, could be whatever. And then visitors of people that are coming in might be employees, might be customers, might be guests, might be patients, might be whatever. So just trying to standardize that so we don't have to use those, uh, you know, well, employee, visitor, guest, whatever. So just a little bit of uh, nomenclature there. So also I wanna get, cover a little bit of Eagle Eye. We've got a lot of folks on the call. I think you know, some of you are recognized, some of you I don't. So I uh, wanna uh, give just a couple of quick slides of what Eagle Eye does in general, but primarily how it's gonna pertain to these thermal cameras. So I'm not gonna kill you with a whole lot of, of marketing stuff, but we're headquartered in Austin, Texas. That's where I live. We also have offices in Amsterdam and Tokyo. Uh, we do cloud-based video surveillance, you guys probably all know that, but globally we have 11 different data centers and we have about 25 different on-site site appliance models, uh, bridges or CMVRs, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, it's all access through mobile or the web, and we've been translated in about eight languages. So, um, you know, we're truly globalized as far as that goes. Uh, we do small business and enterprise end users. I was doing this presentation maybe two or three years ago, that enterprise word wouldn't be on there, but over the last few years, we've really grown into the enterprise space. And we'll talk about some of that. Uh, everything's centrally managed. We've got a strong uh, cybersecurity posture. This is not a cybersecurity presentation, but we do have some, a lot of good documentation on that. And I think that's gonna be important to talk about in a minute here. Uh, also, another big thing that's related to this presentation, the camera flexibility. We're gonna talk about some of the different thermal cameras we're working with. I've got some different uh, you know, pros and cons of those that we'll talk about. And then also, everything you see and everything I talk about is addressable in our API. And I think that's really important as we're talking about thermal cameras. So you'll be able to get the temperature in our API. Now, maybe that's just something simple as an alert, or maybe you want to store that down the road. So there's a little bit of uh, work that needs to be done there, but then it is available. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Two more quick slides on Eagle Eye. So this is our, our little brag slide. Uh, you know, the most recognized brand in commercial VSAS. Again, you guys can read these. Uh, this is one I'm most proud of, honestly, is uh, fastest growing video surveillance company in North America. That was by Deloitte. Uh, we were part of their Fast 500. We were awarded that last year. And IHS market uh, claims we got 19.9% of the uh, VSAS market share. So 
that's a uh, you know, little brag slide there. Won't spend any more time on that. I do want to focus on this for just a moment because some of the components in our system are going to be uh, referenced here. So I just want to make sure everybody knows these pieces. I'm not going to go in real depth, but as we are, uh, uh, you know, as we're going through, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So we support a bunch of different cameras, including analog, not important here, but we support different thermal cameras as well. They connect to an on-site appliance that we call a bridge or a CMVR for this presentation. I'm just going to be calling it all a bridge, but it could be either one. And the bridge has a local hard drive to hold video and then can also uh, send that to the cloud when, uh, uh, you know, based on available bandwidth, based on, um, you know, time of day, based on schedule, et cetera. Uh, there's no inbound ports needed. Again, not going to talk a lot about different uh, technologies or cybersecurity here, but just know it makes an outbound connection to the cloud. We have a lot of algorithms around bandwidth management, when to send it to the cloud, how much to send, camera by camera. Uh, once the video gets to the cloud and the data, the metadata, which in this case we're talking about is like temperature data, it's all encrypted and it's stored three times on three different disks on three different servers. Uh, it's all browser and mobile based. We run our own cloud. Again, we can uh, talk about that a little bit more uh, in another presentation if you're interested. And we can store the video either locally or in the cloud. And I think that'll be important for a couple of things that we'll be talking about here in a minute. So last general eagle eye slide before we get into the thermal stuff, is everything that we talk about, like I said, our cameras, our bridge, the cloud, it's all wrapped in a REST-based API. This allows us to integrate nicely with third-party applications, whether that's access control systems, we're gonna talk a little bit about Brevo, uh, or other alarm monitoring, some other analytics. Uh, point of sale, probably not as important for this discussion, but you know, this is a standard slide. Uh, but also being able to make custom portals or custom mobile apps. And some of the customers I've talked to are really interested in doing some of these things uh, with some of this data that we're gonna be talking about. So that's kind of the setup. Let's jump into the thermal stuff. So first thing, not all thermal cameras are the same. So I know we've got a lot of folks on the call, but it seemed like a lot of people are traditionally from the video surveillance industry, and that makes a ton of sense. Uh, that's you know, our general market. And so when people are thinking about thermal cameras, they're usually thinking about something like this guy, you know, a camera that's used to detect a person doesn't really matter how accurate it is, you know, five degrees Fahrenheit, I think that's about two degrees Celsius, but it's fine to say, hey, there's a person there, or there's a vehicle there, or maybe that's an animal. You're not really concerned about the details of that person. By the way, this happens to be me standing in my driveway. They say the camera adds 10 pounds. I think a thermal camera adds 30 or 40. Uh, there's no hiding anything from a thermal camera. But in this case, uh, the, the image, the visible image, may or may not be as important uh, because you see, you detect a person's there, that's enough information for you to act on. You don't necessarily need to know who it is right away in order to go, hey, there's a person and this may or may not be a problem, right? When we're talking about temperature screening cameras, things are a little bit different. Yes, the thermal camera is, you know, still similar, might look the same on the outside, but accuracy is much more important, uh, you know, generally less than one degree Fahrenheit or half a degree Celsius. And also the visible images become much more important as well, because if there is somebody that has a higher temperature, then you wanna know who it is, not just somebody, right? Because you wanna go deal with that. So visible images become much more important. So while we're gonna talk primarily about the uh, temperature screening cameras, just be aware as you're talking about thermal cameras, that there's really at least two different classifications of, of these, and there, there's probably more, but the ones that are generally used for perimeter protection, and the ones that are for temperature screening. So be careful you understand what the use case is when you're selecting a camera. And just like there's different cameras, there's different types of organizations out there that have different needs. So again, this applies to security in general, but it especially applies to uh, the thermal camera screening. So if we think about something, high risk facilities like hospitals or nursing homes, elderly care facilities, they've got high risk occupants, patients, tenants, whatever, that letting somebody who through that shouldn't be getting through is much more important than in maybe some other areas. So the needs are different for different organizations. So you can think about places, like entertainment facilities. Uh, I saw a deal about Disneyland is wanting to reopen. They're losing you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, their needs are gonna be different than that of a hospital uh, where a large footprint retail, whether it's big box stores, grocery stores, people have been going in and out of grocery stores 
all, for the last few months already, maybe there's not, they don't have as big of a need as somebody such as Disneyland to get people back to work. Uh, also restaurants, there's a wide range of these. Some of our customers that have drive-through facilities, they're actually doing pretty well. The, uh, their business has certainly taken a bit of a hit, but because they're already able to serve people without coming into the restaurant, they're not doing as bad as some of these other restaurants that are uh, dine-in only. And so their needs might be slightly different. Uh, again, you look at multi-tenant commercial, whether that's office space or strip mall type of places. There, you know, if you've got a high-rise building where you can put a couple of cameras or a couple of screening checkpoints at the front door and screen thousands of people, that might be a little bit different situation than say a strip mall where somebody you know, you can kind of go into any store and you'd have to put a screening location essentially at every store. And last one, I've got churches, schools, beaches, parks, places where people gather by nature. They're gonna have completely different needs. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is that I want you guys to be thinking about uh, that there's not one solution that fits all for all these. And maybe some of these thermal cameras aren't even a fit. Like most tools, this, like most things, this is a tool and the tool can be used different ways and the tool could be abused. An example I give, you know, if I, a hammer, I can give a hammer to my father and he can build a nice, some nice cabinetry or some nice woodworking stuff. I give a hammer to my son, he's gonna put it through, they'll put a hole in the wall. So, uh, you know, same tool, same uh, designed use, but it could be used different ways and in some cases even abused. So I want you guys to be thinking about that as you're going forward with your, to your customers or for your facilities, how do you, you know, is this the right tool? And we'll talk about some of the pros and cons. So here's some factors as, you know, mainly this is more towards the consultants, towards the integrators that they're, they're looking for a customer. And even if you are an end user on the call here, I know we have a few, you know, think about your facilities. Like for example, does your organization require on-site visitors? You know, is this something like churches are a great example. A lot of churches have found ways to continue to deliver their services to their parishioners without people coming in. Uh, you know, schools the same way. You know, kids are working from or doing schoolwork from home more or less. I don't know about you guys, but my son is doing less than than more. But uh, but these folks maybe not don't have the same rush to get back into the office. Uh, and but can they work on a limited capacity? You know, we're seeing that in some restaurants limited capacity here in Texas. Restaurants are able to serve 25% capacity within their dining room. Some restaurants are saying, yes, that's fine. Some restaurants are saying, no, that's not enough. They're remaining closed. So other, another thing is, what impact will screening have on attendance? This is almost a very personal, very, um, uh, people have a lot of strong reactions to this. Some folks, I think, like if you look at entertainment places, they're gonna say, hey, I, or gyms, I'm gonna feel safer going into a gym or to a theater into something knowing that everybody's been screened. And so I think that would help those businesses. But other places might say, hey, I, other people, I don't wanna go. This is information that people don't need about me and I'm not going there. So you need to evaluate what is your core audience, your core constituency gonna be thinking about this. And then what is the cost of screening? We're gonna to touch on some of the cost here, but one of the things that I want to people to think about throughout this, I'm gonna say it a few different times. I've said already, this is a tool. And as a tool, it's not the complete solution for screening. It's the, the implement that does screening, but there's a lot of process that needs to come in mind with this. So there's the cost of buying the tools, but there's also the cost of utilizing them, of having somebody say, okay, I see you have too high of a temperature. I need you to step over here, please, sir or ma'am, and then have a secondary evaluation. Or you know, maybe your facility isn't set up to handle this kind of thing from a floor plan or a layout perspective. You need to build some new walls or close some entrances. And we're seeing some of this stuff with grocery stores where they're putting through the, uh, uh, you know, what direction you can go in the aisles and what doors you can go in and what doors you can go out. So there's, there's definitely more than just buying a camera involved with putting these things together. And then what's the effectiveness? Uh, you know, there's different, uh, different solutions have different levels of uh, effectiveness. And so you gotta combine all these different things. Hey, how, how real is this gonna be? And is it worth the cost? So, and lastly, this is if we got any lawyers on the phone, by the way, I'm not a lawyer and I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, 
but there's certainly liability concerns. There's liability concerns if you're screening people and someone still gets sick, and there's probably different liability concerns if you're not screening and somebody still gets sick. So it's kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. And so these are just some of the factors to consider as you're starting to deploy these things. Uh, and uh, I, I've talked to a lot of different customers over the last few weeks about this. And some people are saying, hey, even if it works 50% of the time, we've got to try to do something. And then other people are saying, hey, look, if it's not 95% accurate, then I'm going to do nothing because it's not worth it. And you know, each organization, depending on their level of risk and depending on their, their situation, can make those different decisions. So, just, and I'm sure there's a lot more than this. These are just some of the things that we've talked to, to customers about. All right, so here's, this isn't really a disclaimer, but here's some scientific stuff here for a moment. But thermal cameras can only report the temperature. So just because somebody has an elevated body temperature doesn't mean they're sick. There's a lot of different reasons why somebody might be warm. Uh, maybe they're out exercising. Maybe they've been laying in the sun. Maybe they've been sitting in their car on a conference call for the last 20 minutes and the heater's been blasting on their face. There's a lot of reasons why somebody could have a warm forehead and not be sick or warm body temperature anywhere. Also, the, the cameras, there's different cameras out there and they measure body temperature in different ways. Some of them look for the hottest part of the scene. Those are the usually in the lower end, but it happens. It's like, oh, this is the hottest part because the, there's the assumption that these people being measured are indoors and are in a building that's a lower temperature than the person. And so the person will be the hottest object in there. Not real accurate, but they're out there. Some cameras use uh, facial detection to find a face and then measure the temperature of the forehead. This is what you see in a lot of uh, cameras out there. There's, it's very common. And it makes a lot of sense on at a high level because that's what, you know, like at least for me, that's what my grandma would always do. And I would say, hey, I'm sick. She'd put her hand on my forehead and go, no, you're not, go out and play. <laughs> or, oh, come here, you know. But if she did feel my temperature was warm, she would then give me a thermometer that I'd put under my tongue and see what my temperature actually was. So, you know, this makes a lot of sense and it's pretty common. What seems to be the most accurate, at least according to a lot of the science that's available right now, is the temperature of the eyes. So uh, FLIR is doing this and some other uh, brands as well to where you, they're actually reading the temperature right in the corner of your eye. Now, this means you can't have glasses on to do that. Uh, so different, again, different cameras work in different ways. But again, they're all just measuring a temperature. It doesn't mean somebody's sick. Most of the camera manufacturers that are in this space claim an accuracy of half a degree Fahrenheit. I think it's 0.2 degrees C, but don't quote me on that. Uh, and so that's a much better accuracy than those perimeter protection thermal cameras. Uh, but again, someone can also be sick and not have an elevated temperature. In fact, that's pretty common with uh, COVID-19 is that you can be infected for up to a week or so. And again, I'm not a doctor, but I've heard plenty of people, you can be sick for a week and not exhibit symptoms, i.e. Uh, elevated temperature. So this detects temperature, doesn't detect if somebody's sick. And again, there's my other thing, thermal cameras are a tool, and they have to be used properly. And what that is, is generally an initial screening, and then have, if somebody's elevated, have a secondary screening as well as be deployed in our, the correct manner. So there's also been some news about the FDA. Uh, FDA, US Food and Drug Administration, for those of you that don't know, They've got this document, you look down the bottom, the title, I'm not even gonna try and read the title. It's longer, as long as the whole document itself, there's a link here. We'll include it at the end of this, by the way, we'll send you guys an email with follow-up. We'll include the link to this uh, guidance document in that email, as well as some other things. But here's the four or five bullets that are kind of the relevant here. It's, a, it's very fun reading. But FDA says the equipment should be accurate to 0.9 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you Think of that last slide, most of the camera manufacturers are claiming half a degree, so it's within the FDA guidance. Also, the equipment should use a black body. I'm guessing a lot of you probably don't know what a black body is. It's not dragging somebody off into the, the forest at the end of the day. I got a slide on what a black body is coming up, but it's a calibration unit, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, also, subjects with elevated body temperature should be confirmed with a secondary device. Again, like my grandmother used her hand for the first device, then use the thermometer for the second one. 
same concept here. Use a camera for, hey, let's screen some, do some initial screening. And if somebody is positive or too high of whatever the threshold temperature is, then use an approved medical thermometer. And then also the FDA recommends measuring one subject at a time. And our testing, that's what we followed, one or two subjects. I've got some screenshots of that coming up. But uh, different camera manufacturers claim different capabilities. I saw one saying they could screen, I think, 20 or 30 people at a time. There's a picture of everybody sitting there with a mask and reading everybody at the same time. Uh, so different camera manufacturers may claim more than one at a time. But the other problem is, is so, okay, you see you got 30 people, and then you got to figure out which one was too big of a, too high of a temperature. So that follow on process gets much, much harder to deal with if you're just, you know, wildly scanning everybody in a crowd. How do you deal with that when you find somebody? Uh, so let's show you what some of this looks like. This is our lobby at Eagle Eye, as you can tell by the signs we put up. Uh, this is our lobby in Austin, Texas. And so we've got a dual spectrum camera. We actually have two cameras here, uh, the two different cameras mounted. We just mounted it on this little rolling cart stand that allowed us to move it around as need be. Plus in this facility, the ceiling is pretty high. It'd be really hard to mount the cameras to the ceiling properly. So uh, this cart really served a lot of good purposes. So you have the dual spectrum camera, and we'll talk about what dual spectrum is versus a regular camera in a minute. Uh, the calibration unit or the black body, this is sitting right over the door here, and that's basically emitting heat, and we'll do a little detail on what that is. And then we have our bridge and our, or our CMVR. In this case, it's a bridge. It's sitting on a little shelf here, kind of hard to see the arrows covering it up, but it's just sitting right there. It could be anywhere, but again, we have this whole unit all put together on wheels so it can move it around as need be. And then the local display. This is not required, but uh, I think it'll be very common. So you can see as you're walking in, flashes green if you're um, you know, under the threshold, flashes red if you're over the threshold. So uh, several, of, many of our customers use a local display, although a lot don't today without the thermal cameras. I think almost everybody using thermal cameras will use a local display, although like I said, it's certainly not required. So let's talk about these individual components. So this particular camera is a Sunel camera, as it says right there. It looks like a panda. Uh, it's gotten a little bit of notoriety uh, as the panda cam. Not all thermal cameras look like a panda, but the story is that this one does look like a panda because they were originally deployed in schools for children, and they didn't want the children to be scared. So also being able to look directly at the face is a great way to detect the temperature. So this got the kids to look up at the, uh, at the camera so they could get accurate readings. Uh, in fact, you can actually take the ears off, but uh, everyone knows it as the Panda Cam. But dual spectrum cameras have two lenses, one that's in the thermal spectrum and one that's in the visual spectrum. So the visual spectrum lens works just like almost any other camera. In this camera, I believe it's a two megapixel, but it could be different. Uh, and then the thermal camera works uh, similar to a visible spectrum camera, but instead of uh, each pixel being a different shade of color, in a thermal camera, each pixel is a different temperature. Uh, it measures, uh, measures heat, thermal camera. So each pixel is a different temperature. And the way that a lot of these dual spectrum cameras work, like I said earlier, is the visual spectrum will grab where is the face in the, in the scene, hand that off to the thermal camera, and the thermal camera will then grab the temperature of the face. And I got a couple of screenshots in a minute showing you how that works. Uh, these are not cheap. Currently running anywhere between $8,000 and $20,000. Um, you know, and I'm sure there's some that cost more, but and there, there might be a few that cost less. Uh, this is not meant to be a price list, but just to give you guys an idea of, of the cost on these things. The other thing is, is not only are they expensive, but they're hard to find at the moment. Uh, there's some are being prioritized for high risk, like I was talking about hospitals or other uh, first responder situations, but uh, and we'll talk about availability, but they're not easy to find at the moment, even if you got the money to spend. Most of these also require that black body or a calibration unit. Not all of them do. Some of them it's optional, but the calibration unit, some of them it's required, but it does help these cameras become more accurate. The other thing that may or may not make a difference to the folks on the phone here or on the webinar, but most of these are made in China. There's a few of them made outside of China, but if you're looking at the ones that are going to be available or that are available, they're coming out of China. And uh, you know, there's a few reasons for that. One, China makes a lot of stuff. Two, they've had scares of this kind, and they've, they're a little bit ahead on the manufacturing side, at least, 
on the thermal cameras because they've been deployed in China for a lot longer than we've been worrying about it in the US at least. So the calibration unit. So it's an instrument that emits heat basically. It uh, is adjustable to different temperatures and like a heater, it takes a while to come up to temperature, but unlike a heater, it can be set very specifically. And I'll show you a couple of pictures here in a second. These are not physically connected to the camera or the VMS. Uh, what happens is you turn it on and within the camera, you draw a box around where the uh, black body is. And then you tell the camera, this is set to whatever temperature and there's recommendations uh, for what's set. I say here, the general costs about 2000 US. We've seen them as low as 1200 and as much as $3,000. These things I think are gonna be even harder to get than the thermal cameras, at least initially. They're generally scientific instruments used for calibration of, um, of different devices and they're not, they're not used a lot because they're kind of expensive. You know, maybe somebody that's got a thermal gun that's used to measure temperatures or look for fire, they'll have one for a group of people, they'll calibrate their little thermal gun and then they'll take their thermal guns out in the field and then three or four months later, come back and recalibrate their thermal gun. That's generally what they've been used for up until now. But with these thermal cameras, it requires a one-to-one -one matching. This black body goes with this camera. So I think these are gonna be a little bit harder to find for a while. So here's a little quick picture of what it looks like. You've got the camera uh, over on, you know, in this case on the left, with the black body hung above the people. Remember in my picture before, we hung it up above the door. Uh, here's an image of what one looks like. You can see that basically the green is what we have set this to. In this case, this is Celsius, 40 degrees Celsius, and you can adjust it up or down. Uh, and then the red is what it's actually emitting at. So when we start and plug this thing in, this starts out at, uh, well, it's not zero, but whatever the room is, I'm not a good Celsius guy, but you know, probably 20 degrees Celsius, and then it warms up to 40 and then it stops. And Throughout the day, you'll see this go up you know, to 40.1 or down to 39.8 or 39.0. So it fluctuates a little bit. So this is one model. Here's another model, uh, similar, uh, but uh, slightly different. And there's a bunch of different models of these black bodies, just like there's a bunch of different models of camera. You can have all, but they all work the same way. So in this case, this one on the left, this is the emitter area. So essentially in the camera, we drew a box around this emitter and said that it was set to 40 degrees Celsius. And so what happens is that instead of trying to figure out the temperature from scratch, the camera says, well, this box that sits up here, we know that's 40 degrees Celsius. And then this face that's down here, we can just do a difference between the two instead of having to, uh, to figure it out from, from nothing. So point of reference. If those photographers in the audience, it's kind of like the white balance feature of some higher end cameras. So you know what your white point is, but in this case, you know a set temperature. So this is how Eagle Eye works with this stuff. I apologize for the rudimentary drawing, but essentially the visual specter or the, uh, the camera has, camera body has two cameras in it. So the visual spectrum, like I said, is a normal, pretty much everyday IP camera. Thermal spectrum is not, but they're essentially two different cameras. But, oh, by the way, one of the things that I, kind of glossed over before. There's only one ethernet connection on this. So even though I've got three arrows, there's only one cable connecting all this. But these three streams of data come over the same cable, uh, the video, the thermal video, and then also the temperature data. So most of these cameras, not all, but most can report the temperature separately from the video. So in the screenshots I'm gonna show you next, you can see that it, they show the temperature on the screen but then they can also give you a stream. So almost like on-camera analytics can send you events, alerts, et cetera. The same concept with the thermal cameras that the camera can send the, uh, obviously the video, but then can also send you, hey, this subject with a screenshot, a screen capture of their face was at such and such a temperature. So that all comes to our bridge. The local display connects to the bridge just like uh, any, we do this today, so there's nothing fancy there. But uh, you can plug an HDMI cable into the bridge, and some models have DisplayPort, or I don't think we have VGA anymore, but we might. But check the data sheet on the bridge for what the connections are to, to plug a monitor in. But you just connect that right to the bridge, and it'll you can configure what screens are shown. In this example, we're showing both the thermal and the visual spectrum. You can choose to do that. You can choose not to, whatever you want to do. 
But then the bridge sends all the data to the cloud. And then from the cloud, it gets to you know, your laptop, your iPad, your iPhone, or Android tablet, or, or whatever your device is. I don't have it up here. We also could connect to third-party systems from here as well So uh, you know, through our API. So uh, that's at a high level how it works. Let me show you what the screenshots look like. So this is a thermal screen. So you'll notice here that this is saying reading 97.2. In our testing, and let me just stop for a second and talk about our testing. We've been examining these things for several weeks, a couple of months maybe, and we've seen that the thermal cameras always seem to read less than what a handheld thermometer reads. And we've got a white paper that goes through some of the testing, so I'm not gonna read out all the, the test data here. But uh, essentially, it was always there was always some kind of offset in different cameras or a little bit of an offset but usually it was less than a degree, maybe half a degree to 0.7 degrees, somewhere in there was kind of the offset that always seemed to read less than. And so using, knowing that, you can set your threshold a little bit lower than what you, uh, uh, than, than what you wanna read. So if you're wanting to read somebody that has a skin temperature of 101 degrees, you could set your alert to 100.3 and, and get there. So there's, there's definitely that offset. Uh, I'm not, by the way, I'm not monitoring the questions really, but one did just pop up. Someone was asking what time of the, is the delay? Uh, for, and it's usually, it depends on the network, but about one second to two seconds somewhere in there. It's, for those of you that are current Eagle Eye users, the alert is exactly the same as our motion detection or line crossing or whatever. This is just a new alert type that comes in uh, when, you know, when the, the threshold is exceeded. So, Couple other quick things, and by the way, with regard to questions, we're going to get to all the questions hopefully at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation as well. But you'll notice here that this subject in the front, who actually it turns out to be my wife. By the way, I use pictures of me and my family in here, so there'd be no problems about you know privacy concerns, which I saw was another thing we'll, we'll touch on in a minute. But so it's 100% consent for everybody that's in this presentation. So uh, you'll see where it grabbed the face and the blue X is where it measured her temperature. Me back here hasn't got to me yet because one of the things that you do in the, uh, uh, in the camera settings is you draw an area of where you want the face to be measured. And I'll show you what that kind of looks like here in a second. So measured uh, my wife there, another screen. Now, as I've walked in a little bit, it measured me as well. And like I said, it does the facial detection and then it uh, passes that off and measures the forehead. A little bit easier to find my forehead as I get older, that forehead's getting bigger. It's, it's almost to a five head at this point. But uh, now here I wanna show this. I brought my dog in on purpose and I, I'm a dog guy, I like my dog, but he's a great Dane. He weighs 150 pounds and he emits a lot of heat, but he's not being picked up even when he's walking to the front door because the facial detection you know, it doesn't detect dog faces, it detects human faces. And so then when I come in later, it's got me. And then here, you can see where it's picked up my wife yet, but hasn't yet read her temperature. So this was the point where it's, hey, here's the face, but hasn't been handed off yet. And then what does it look like if someone has a higher temperature? I'm sure everyone's wondering that. Well, a couple of things. One, uh, I guess fortunately for our office building, we haven't had anybody with an actual high temperature walk through which is good for all the people that are in the building, although not a ton of people in the building these days, but it's bad for our tests. So what we did to simulate a elevated temperature is we had a piece of ceramic that we would soak in some warm water, get that heated up to temperature, and then walk through with that uh, kind of held up to our forehead. And this is what that looks like. And this one we were measuring in Celsius. Now this one, I'm gonna point out a few things. One, you can see the black body in here. The other images I'd cropped to fit on the screen, so you couldn't see the black body in the field of view. But here, we left the black body in, and also you can see, you know, it's kind of hard to see, but they're, this guy's holding the little piece of ceramic up to his forehead, and you can see that it picked up 38 degrees C. Now, I think that's kind of kind of warm for a temperature, but uh, we're using it to not necessarily test the accuracy in this case, but to say, okay, what happens with downstream with the system when we detect something elevated. So this is, these screens are exactly what you would see on the local display. So as people are walking in, you're seeing the, the red or the green, you're seeing the temperature read out there. And it's also what you would see in the mobile phone or on the web display. So you're seeing this right on the screen in real time as it happens. Of course, there's a little bit of a delay getting it to your mobile phone 
So the local display is a little bit faster, again, depending on your network, um, you know, one or two seconds. Um, you know, local display is real time where, you know, going up to the cloud and then back down to your phone takes uh, a little bit of time, but it's still pretty quick to real time. It's not minutes delayed, it's, you know, a couple of seconds. Other thing that's just kind of interesting here, you can see these black dots that are here. That's actually the water that's been dripping from holding this thing that was soaked in the water. Uh, we cropped it off the bottom, but it got a little wet on the floor. You can see the water and it was all black. But just uh, you know, some of the fun things we've learned with dealing with thermal cameras. So this is, um, this is what it looks like. I was trying to do video. We're going to post a video about this stuff. Uh, we actually have Dean Draco, our CEO, has posted a video on LinkedIn, but we've had technical issues on Zoom and on Google Meet sharing videos, so that's why I went with the screenshots, but we will have some videos out so you can see how this works in real time. I uh, just didn't want to you know, try to battle the Zoom meeting with video today. So here's the big question. Do these work? And the answer is generally yes. They, they generally work, but there's a whole lot of caveats coming here. So let's you know, please pay attention to this because I think this is going to be some of the most important part of the presentation here. So again, there's where they're a tool, they're a piece of the solution. You need a controlled environment. So people have asked me, hey, does this work outside? Nope, doesn't work outside. Uh, you know, so you need the controlled environment and it needs to be reasonable. And again, different camera manufacturers have different uh, guidelines that should be adhered to, but some of the general ones don't be measuring right underneath the air conditioning vent. Don't be measuring right underneath a heating duct or by a heating register. Register. Um, some of the other things, if your door, in our case, our building, the, those doors were all glass. And that's generally a bad thing because the glass will absorb and radiate heat from direct sunlight. But in our case, our building has a pretty good awning, maybe 20 feet of awning out there. So there's no direct sunlight hitting that glass. So in our case, it worked out pretty well. Uh, but you know, these are things that you need to be thinking about that you don't necessarily think about when you're deploying a, a traditional visual spectrum camera. But let me give you a little bit of analogy here. It's kind of like thinking about how light hits the scene throughout the day and whether you need a WDR camera or a camera that does a low light capability or bright white capability. Uh, it's similar to that. And the fact that a lot of folks don't think about those. That's why we've got a lot of people that are camera experts. And so don't think that just because you're a camera expert on visual spectrum that you're a camera expert on thermal spectrum. One of the things I've learned as we've been going through this is there is a ton of stuff that I don't know. Uh, in fact, I equated it to my team uh, when I was talking to them that I spent a lot of time on an airplane and I know how to navigate the airport real well and do all those things, but I've got no idea how to fly the plane. I wouldn't even know how to start it. And the more I get going through thermal cameras and what they're doing from a technology perspective, I think I get that. But the deployment, I think we're just, at least in the US, we're just getting started at figuring out some of the details here. And so there's gonna be a learning process for everybody as we go through and determine, you know, I was talking to somebody and they, I live in Texas, so I don't think about this, but somebody that lives up north in Minneapolis, like, well, what happens when, you know, during the temperature when it's really cold and someone comes in with a coat, with a hood and a face mask on? Yeah, good point. Do you make everybody take their hood off and their face mask off before they walk in the building? Maybe. Um, so I'm just saying there's going to be a lot of deployment stuff that we learn along the way as we're navigating this new sense of normal. Uh, that goes to my next point. You need a cooperative subject. You know, if you've got, if you're doing facial recognition or facial detection and somebody's got their hood tied up really tight, you can't even see their face, they're probably not going to get measured. If somebody has got a cold cloth they know they've got a temperature and they're holding this cold cloth on their head before they walk in the building, they're probably going to fool the, the camera. And, you know, these things can be fooled pretty easily. Uh, I, I want to be very clear on that with folks that this is a new technology and there's a lot that is out there to be discovered and to be developed. And again, the process and the tooling need to be important are, are an important consideration because the, uh, you know, when, it's kind of like facial recognition in a lot of ways for those of you that are dealing with video analytics, that especially in the early days, you'd see the demo of the facial recognition and work great in the demo, but then, you know, you put it in your facility and because the lighting's not right or the camera angle's not right or, or whatever, it wasn't working. Now, facial recognition's come a long way, 
uh, and I'm not trying to pitch it, but I'm just saying things have changed now. But 10 years ago, there's a lot of companies pitching facial recognition and say, oh yeah, well, we're deployed in the, uh, some subway somewhere in Asia and we're reading thousands of people an hour or a minute or whatever they would say. Well, yeah, but there, they're going through a turnstile. People are stopping, they're looking, you know, they got controlled lighting and all that, but you deploy it out on the street and it doesn't work. So I think we need to think about that a lot as, as we're going forward here. Uh, also, at least from the FDA, these require secondary screening. So, and again, this is part of the process that if somebody does read too high, what do you do? I think you need to really sit down with your customer, sit down with your, your board or your staff or whatever and say, hey, what do we do with this? A um, couple of things that have been coming in here, I'm gonna to touch on it briefly here and we can talk about it more later, but something that we're not even thinking about, at least in the US, they're more concerned about it in Europe, but privacy. Uh, you know, whether that's GDPR in Europe, the US, we got HIPAA process or HIPAA regulations. You know, now you've got what could be considered medical information, or maybe it's not. You know, there's a whole debate about that. What do you do with that data? Who gets access to that? And who doesn't get access to that? You know, we've had this running in our building, and quite honestly, you know, we're not the only tenants in our building. And the other tenants come in, they're like, what's this crazy looking thing? As we explain it to them, they felt pretty good and they felt safer coming in. Now that's not a scientific study, that's not a legal study, that's just some anecdotal information of folks in Austin, Texas saying, oh, I like this, it makes me feel better. But there's gonna be a lot of things that come out about this. And by the way, did I mention, the organization needs a process, all right? That's just, you know, certainly, uh, if I don't say that enough, uh, just remember that, uh, please. So. Eagle Eye thermal screen features, what do we do with this? Well, we record both the video streams, the thermal and the visual spectrum. You saw that, those screenshots, we're recording those. You can play live video, play recorded video. We're also recording the temperature data as discrete data. So as that temperature data is coming in, we're storing that in line with the video. If, for those of you familiar with our platform, similar to how we store motion detection data or any of the other alerts, it's right in the history browser. You can scroll, you can find it. Uh, and we're, so we're storing that. We're working on right now the threshold alerting. So by the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be able to inject that right into the alert stream. It's actually kind of working now, but we're, we're working through debugging it. So being able to say, set a threshold for a specific camera, say 100 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever degrees Celsius. And then if there's somebody that comes through, send that alert. And again, that'll work just like our regular alerts where you can get email, push notification to your mobile device. Or if you subscribe to our API, you can get that alert through the API. Coming after that is the report. This is after the fact. So being able to query that data and be able to uh, say, okay, uh, show me the total number of screenings in this camera or this location. Show me everybody that was above or below a threshold uh, or show everybody that meets this certain criteria this time of day, this camera, this, uh, uh, you know, this temperature range. And then also, when those, those results will have links to the specific videos. So that's what we're working on. Uh, you know, these are some rough dates. We're trying to do it as fast as we can. Trust me, this is definitely one of our top priorities we're working on right now. Now, let me talk about some of the complementary features and maybe you'll see where the tie-in on my intro was a little bit. As I said, a lot of these cameras come from China and we got a slide on a few cameras that we're, uh, we've worked with coming up here, but you're getting their names you recognize. And some people have cybersecurity concerns about that. For those of you that don't know, we have something we call camera cyber lockdown, and essentially it isolates the cameras from the internet. That works with these cameras. So if you are a little concerned about the cybersecurity strength of the camera, we've got a feature that can help with that. Now, some people might say, hey, I don't care, doesn't matter. Okay, that's fine, just letting you know that it's there. Also, those of you that have set up an Eagle Eye system, pretty straightforward to do because we don't need the inbound ports, because we don't need a static IP address. I think that there's gonna be a lot of people, I'll jump to the low bandwidth mode, that wanna set this up maybe on a cellular connection and a, maybe not as portable as what I showed you, but just kind of a standalone system that's not necessarily tied into the rest of the surveillance of the building. They're looking for a point solution and they say, hey, just put it on a cradle point and connect it. So we've got simplified setup, the, that local display and the low bandwidth mode we can run in and hold that video locally. I think those are things that are gonna help those, those people that are looking for a quick solution and maybe it's not tied into everything else in the building. Also the remote access. One of the customers I've spoken with over the last few weeks, they're 
planning to deploy this type of a solution to screen their employees. They're a grocery store chain. And obviously their employees work with food. And so they wanna make sure that they're screening all their employees as they're coming in. And one of the things that they're concerned about is that if somebody is maybe has an elevated temperature, that the shift supervisor, whoever's doing this might say, oh, I really need this guy to work today. So uh, we're just gonna pretend that that never happened. So the remote access to the video and the data is very important so that someone from corporate can watch the people that are on site making these decisions and the corporate folks can get an alert that it's not only an alert for somebody that's sitting there holding the handheld system, right? Because if you just got a handheld system, you're putting all your trust in the person that's holding that temperature gun or whatever it is to make sure that they're doing the right thing. Now, in some cases that might be fine, but in larger corporations, they wanna have some checks and balances and, and we can help provide that. Another feature that's fairly new for Eagle Eye, although it's been in beta for a while, uh, but we did release it a couple of weeks ago to everybody, is archiving. Let me explain what this is shortly and then how it ties into thermal cameras. So let's say you're storing all your video 30 days, and that's great for you. You know, obviously you can store it longer or less, but whatever, it doesn't matter. You're storing your video 30 days. Well, you find some interesting clip. Maybe it's somebody stealing. Maybe it's a slip and a fall. Maybe it's somebody with an elevated temperature. You can now actually archive that video, keep it in the Eagle Eye Cloud, organize it in a folder structure, and share that video with somebody else. So what you might want to do is if somebody has an elevated temperature, you can say, I want to archive that. And now you can prove that you did whatever you need to do. Hey, I tracked this guy. We, we got him out of the building. Or and so you can archive video from other cameras as well. It can get as elaborate as you want. Audit trail. This is also something that's been around for a while, and maybe not everybody knows about it. But you can actually track a lot of different things within Eagle Eye, but also who's watching what video, who is downloading, who is archiving, who is making settings changes, those kinds of things. So the audit trail is available so you can say, hey, look, we are watching this video. Uh, Brevo integration. I know we've got a lot of folks on the, the phone that uh, are brief, familiar with Brevo. I've got a couple of slides at the end to talk about Brevo, but we're working with those guys to start to exchange some data and maybe do some things. I know there's a lot of folks that go, hey, I got an idea that if somebody's got too high of a temperature, don't unlock the door. Well, I think that's technically possible, but again, the process, the procedure, like how long do you not unlock the door? What happens if someone comes behind them? So there's some things that you know, are technically possible, but maybe don't fit every scenario. And then also that the, uh, all the data and the alerts are available via our API. And again, I've talked with folks that wanna store that, pull that information into their own customer management database. Think about like gyms that are screen, you know, trying to get back to work and they wanna be able to say, hey, you know, this person badged in, we read their temperature and you know, we, we did something with it. So uh, again, there's a whole lot of process that needs to be figured out around that, but those are all technically capable things. So we are gonna have a thermal camera. It's gonna be available to order next week, hopefully on Monday. So talk with your sales folks. We're gonna, uh, we don't have the image of it, but uh, it'll be available later in this month. Uh, usually a couple of weeks. Now, here's a couple of things that I want to talk about. This is going to require a special purchase agreement There's that we're still working on. That's why we say hopefully on Monday we've got some stuff to talk about. But here's some of the things. It's going to require prepayment, and it's about two to three week lead time. And we're going to have a special course on Eagle Eye University to, to, for this. So we've got some contact information coming out there. But you don't have to use an Eagle Eye camera if you don't want to. Just like with our other, we have other visual spectrum cameras that work just fine. I've got them on my house. Uh, you know, lots of our customers use them. Lots of customers use other cameras too. That's okay. We're gonna continue to support other cameras. And some of the questions are, which cameras? Well, Sunel, I talked about that earlier. Uh, and so what I've done is put three different categories in here. You know, if we support the video, if we support the thermal video, and if we support the temperature data. So this is gonna be changing over time and growing just like our camera list has been growing over time. Uh, you know, seven years ago when we started out, we didn't support many cameras. I think today there's over 3,000 different models that we support. Obviously not many of those are thermal, but just like that though, we'll be adding to the list of thermal cameras that we support. The trick here though, is that there's one extra layer, which is this temperature data. And so let me run through these. So these names are people that you 
recognize Sunel, High Vision, Dawa, Mobotics, Axis, FLIR. Probably everybody asks me about FLIR. We'll get to that one in just a second. Um, you know, so supporting the video and the thermal video is pretty much just like supporting any other general camera out there. We get a video stream over RTSP. You know, ideally it's compatible with OnVIF. Most of these are. Uh, and then we can just pull that video in. It's pretty straightforward. The trick is pulling in the temperature data. And it's not because it's a hard technical thing to do. There's a data stream, we pull it in, we record it. What we're finding is with a lot of these manufacturers, and I'm not gonna name names here, but that there's some bugs, or shall we say features, whatever you wanna call it, where maybe the, the temperature data timestamp doesn't line up with the video timestamp, or where it says, hey, there's an alert in here, but if there's three people in the field of view, it doesn't tell you which one. Now these things show fine on the screen, but when you get the data from the camera, there's some inconsistencies. And so what we've been doing for the past few weeks is we've been ex examining these things, is we've been working with the manufacturers to say, hey, we found this. And so they're going back and, and addressing it. So that's why some of these things like the Sunel camera, we've been working with those guys quite a bit. And yeah, we're, we're pretty close on that. Uh, it's, it's working pretty well. Uh, high, we're working and we think we've got a fix, but it's not quite implemented. So, uh, you know, Dawa, we've been working with those guys. Apparently, they've got a new lower cost camera coming out this month. Uh, I don't know much about it. We haven't seen it yet, but uh, it's supposedly going to be fairly, well, more affordable than the other ones. So we're going to get one at it and, and see how it works. Uh, Mobotics, we're working with those cameras. We hadn't supported them for a long time. I know different pockets of the U.S. are Mobotics fans and more so in Europe, but we are supporting Mobotics cameras now and we're working with them to support their thermal data. Axis, this is an interesting one. Axis has said, now they may change their, their mind on this or they may change their position, but so far they said their thermal cameras should not be used for temperature screening. So we do support the Axis thermal cameras, uh, but we're, as far as the temperature data, we haven't yet pulled that in. We're looking to see if we can, but uh, uh, you know, Axis is saying don't use their cameras or at least the ones that are out today for temperature screening. The big one that everyone talks about is FLIR. So the current FLIR cameras that are out there are, it, FLIR makes a wide range of products and they're probably, you know, I, I think they're definitely considered one of the leaders in the thermal camera space. They've been doing it for a long time. Uh, but they, and they've got handheld units. We actually bought one of their handheld units to test uh, accuracy of some of the other cameras. But their units that work with VMSs are fairly limited. And so we are going to support their A400 and their A700, which are being released this month. And so we've talked to the guys at FLIR, we're earmarked to get one. They don't even have those products yet, um, the early release. So who knows when those are gonna be available, but the FLIR A400 and A700 are the ones that we're gonna support. And again, this is accurate as of today, all this information, but there's more stuff coming. I'm talking to more companies. Uh, so thermal camera companies are coming to us. Customers are saying, hey, I'm interested in this. So the, the landscape of cameras that we're going to support is going to grow over time. Uh, all right, speaking of time, I was just doing a quick time check. We're almost done, so we sh I should get wrapped up in a couple of slides, and then we'll have some time for questions. So uh, future outlook. I think that the larger organizations are going to install these things pretty quickly. The kind of thing where there's a high rise and you can install a couple of cameras, uh, you know, two, three cameras and get people back to work pretty quick. Uh, I think that's what's going to happen in the next few months. We also believe that these, because of that, these are going to be harder and harder to get. And so the prices are going to fluctuate, but the, and so will the, the supply. But probably over the next, by, by the end of the year, so over the next, call it five, six months, uh, production is ramping up and we think it'll eventually catch up and then so prices will start to get lower uh, in 2021. According to our sources, the, uh, the reason for the price increase is not profiteering, it's the components. So the components have thus far been in pretty low demand up until the last few months. And so the, the components for the thermal cameras are pretty hard to find. And that's what's causing, uh, what's driving the, the cost. I'm sure there's some people trying to make a buck out there too, but it seems to be the components on the thermal cameras. Uh, so where do you go to get more information? We've got a landing page on our website, en.com slash thermal. You can go there. 
Um, I think there's a link to this webinar on there right now. Obviously, don't sign up for it now. But uh, the uh, uh, you know, so we got a white paper out there that I talked about. It's about 15 pages. Put it by your bedside. Help you go to sleep at night uh, if you want. We're going to be updating that with some new test data. We got it out early with some limited test data, so we'll have some more out there. Uh, our Eagle Eye sales team and sales engineering team, you can reach those at sales at EEN.com. That works globally. We'll get you to the right source there so you can reach out to those folks. We've got an overview coming. I wanted to get this presentation done, get the questions out of the way, and then figure out, okay, what, what topics. So we're going to have a one-pager or a two-pager, kind of a front and back thing of the overview for this. Uh, our data sheet on our camera, the S-series, it's, um, it's actually pretty much done. we got to finalize a few things. So that's coming out. And then we also have a little explainer video, which is going to be uh, something we put together that's, uh, you know, hey, this is a camera and this is how you aim it and stuff. By the way, I want to be sure I mention this before we get into the questions. These cameras are really sensitive. Uh, I showed you one from my driveway. I actually have had it on my house for a while before all this started. I'll, if you guys are interested, I'll tell you the story. But the first time it got handed to me, First, I go, oh, that's the thermal imager, and I wanted to touch it. And the guy that was handed to me, I'll give him a shout out, Matt Webster on my team. He almost smacked my hand, like, don't touch it. If you touch the thermal imager lens with your hand, the oil from your hand can ruin the lens. So these are just very sensitive, very sensitive instruments, not at all like the IP cameras that we normally work with. So uh, just be really careful with them. That's some of the, the special instructions we're putting together and, and those kinds of things. So Last two or three slides. I told you I had a slide on Brevo. So this is kind of the general Brevo slide we include with all our webinars. Those of you that don't know Brevo, they do cloud-based access control. They're a sister company to Eagle Eye. Uh, we, we have common ownership. Uh, Brevo has been around for 20 years. I'm not gonna go through all these details. The important part is what's Brevo doing for this stuff? And so there's a few things. They've actually got a webinar themselves coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, May 21st, it's a Thursday. That'll be included in the link we send out but they're doing user contact reporting, mobile self-screening, visitor reporting, personnel control. And then we're also working with how, okay, once we get this data in there, how can we hand it off to them? That part's coming, not there yet, but uh, you can attend their webinar. And like I said, the follow-up email will include the link to that. So last kind of general plug slide. Those, some of you might also know we have another sister company called Swift Sensors. Swift Sensor does temperature uh, sensing, not thermal stuff like this, but they have Sensors, like think about digital thermometers. They've got vibration, they've got humidity, moisture, all different kinds of stuff. And they can then, you know, based on the temperature, based on the motion, based on uh, vibration, those kinds of things, uh, pull the video in that caused that temperature alert or that motion alert or that vibration alert. You can kind of see this here. Uh, and you know, reach out to us, we can get you connected to that. They don't, we don't have anything related to this thermal camera stuff yet, but I've got some, uh, We've got some ideas that we're working on. So again, a lot of this stuff is very early, uh, but we're all working quickly to make it happen. So with that, uh, Heather, uh, you have some questions that have come in over the, the chat that need to be asked? Absolutely. So well, now we'll be switching over to Q&A. So we'll take some time to answer these questions. Just as a reminder to everyone, you can type your questions into the Q&A box of Zoom and we'll be reading from there. We do have a few that have already come through, so I'll go ahead and get started. For the first one that we have here is, does Eagle Eye Networks integrate with third-party cameras, and if so, where can they find if their thermal camera is compatible? All right, so the answer is yes. We do integrate with third-party cameras. Uh, we're actually gonna be making a new tab on our camera uh, compatibility page, which is een.com slash cameras. You can get to there, and it's not there yet, so everybody don't go rush there there'll be a new tab called thermal screening cameras. So uh, right now, as of today, the ones that we support fully are really only the Sunel. And then uh, the Hype Vision is coming next and probably Dawa, you know, the, the list is that I shared. Uh, so that'll be growing over time uh, as, as we go. And we're, we're working on it quite a bit. Now, where can you get them? That's the trick. Distribution commonly, so Annexter, ADI would be where I would start. Obviously, I mentioned our camera that we're going to have. Uh, you can get that from us uh, through your regular sales channels. Uh, so on Monday, start bugging your uh, regional sales manager, your sales contact for that one. All right. Thanks for that. And so in the case that their thermal camera isn't compatible, what steps can they take? It's a good question. So what can you do to get a camera compatible? Well, the first thing is it needs to be 
on ideally on VIF compliant. And so that's going to eliminate all the handheld stuff, anything that connects to your computer with a USB, those are things that are not going to be compatible with us. So it needs to be an IP camera. Uh, so you can request support through the standard process. So if you've got a camera that you think is working with Eagle Eye, you can plug it into one of our bridges and request support. Uh, that's a great way to go uh, about it. If you just have some questions, contact our, uh, our sales team and they can kind of steer you there. But the key thing to look for is on VIF compatibility, just like with a visual camera. All right, and for the thermal cameras, is there a separate subscription cost with Eagle Eye Networks for that? Good question. So we are taking in two video streams, and so we are recording two streams of video, but we're only gonna charge for one. Now, quite honestly, we haven't quite figured out how to do that, but we don't want to, people to limit the functionality because they don't want to pay for two streams. So uh, we're going to charge for one and it'll be the same price as a visual spectrum camera. So, you know, if you're storing at 30 days or you're storing at 90 days or storing at a year, whatever it is, it's just the same subscription. Uh, in our system, it will probably, probably the first few folks will get billed for two and we'll have to make some kind of adjustment, but our plan is to only bill for the, for the one stream. Okay. And we had a question about the image, in thermal versus the actual clear image? Is that something that's toggled or are they displayed side by side or is it only the thermal image? Yeah, so within Eagle Eye, they're treated as, they look as two different cameras. So you can arrange them however you want. In my demos here, I've put them side by side, but you can have them top to bottom. You could have only one and not the other. Uh, the, uh, there's all different kinds of ways you can arrange that. And some cameras, I think Mobotics, for example, uh, and there may be others, but I know Mobotics actually does an overlay that's actually kind of cool, where it's the visual spectrum for all the background, but anything that moves is the thermal spectrum. Uh, they're the only ones I've seen that do almost like a mashup kind of thing, but uh, we don't do that yet, although that'd be cool. Uh, but yeah, they, you can arrange it however you want. Okay. And also, this is a great idea. I'm not sure if this is something we are considering, but is the thermal camera going to be available in the demo? So we... Probably there's a few privacy things we got to figure out. Uh, we do have one installed at our demo site. Unfortunately, there's nobody there. So that's kind of the problem with the demo is that as people are getting back to work, there's not a lot of uh, movement there, but we ideally want to have some kind of a demo. We've got a couple videos we're stitching together to use. So I would like to have it in there. We're trying to make it happen, but there's a few practical things. And so the answer is right now, I think so, but maybe maybe not <laughs> i know i'm kind of waffling there i'm sorry but we will definitely have videos to share that you can use you can share with your customers that's for sure whether it's available in a live demo you know the problem with that is if there's nobody walking by it's not very exciting so um, th that makes things a little challenge for a live demo all right and i'll go ahead and take this last question which is just the standard process for getting their camera integrated into their system who exactly should they reach out to for that well, so a couple of questions, and I saw one of these others fly by. Does this work with a regular Eagle Eye bridge? The answer is yes. So if you've got a bridge today that you bought five years ago, then this will work with that no problem. We'll need the latest uh, camera drivers or camera support added to it, but that happens fairly frequently anyway. So you don't need to get a special piece of hardware. This is just essentially updated camera support. So your bridge is right now, today, if you took one of these cameras and plugged it in, technically it won't work yet because we haven't finalize the, um, the camera support for it, but it will, and we can do some you know, early adopters. We can get that updated remotely, no problem. So if you have a bridge, all you have to do is plug the camera in, and then on our dashboard, we recognize that it's an unsupported camera, and you can request support from right in your Eagle Eye dashboard. If you don't have one of our bridges, if you know available, or maybe you're a new, new customer, new dealer, uh, you can certainly uh, contact our sales team. It's probably better, this is a little weird, probably better to contact the sales team than the support team because the support team, our tech support team works on broken systems or I mean not broken, but people have questions about existing stuff where our sales team and our sales engineering team support customers that are pre-sales and so they're just geared a little bit better. So bottom line is plug the camera into your bridge if you've got one and request support. If you don't have a bridge, contact sales at EEN.com. Ideally, if you got a data sheet on the camera, that's perfect, or a link to the camera's manufacturer's website. But definitely, we'd at least need a camera make and model because we're going to go find the data sheet or we're going to go find the website and see what they say. Again, looking for OnVIF Profile S compatibility. 
All right, it looks like we have quite a few questions, but that's all we're gonna cover for now since we're right here on the hour. But if you have any remaining questions, please reach out to us via phone or email. We're highly responsive. Our contact information is right here on the slide. We're always available and here to help you. After this, also be sure to check your email because we will be sending out the recording of this webinar as well as more information on thermal cameras. So thank you, Hans, for being our presenter today. Sure. you have any last words? Yeah, and if you like this presentation, my name's Hans Kaler. If you didn't like the presentation, my name's Javen Houston. <laughs> thank you everyone for participating and we really look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.